that we have lost a lot of our revenue at the senior center from our classes. The online classes we're offering for free, but we are requesting that if you have the means and you would like to, please either renew your membership early to the senior center that helps us or make a donation online. And there's on our website, there's information for that. And also on the constant contact that I hope everybody's been getting their constant contacts because there's great information in there. The one that came out on Tuesday was written by me. So of course I know that's great, but I know Susan Davis did one on outdoor things that you can do online last week, which was all also really fantastic. And um, we're also putting some online classes um, that have been recorded up. So if you missed one of these, they should be up soon. If you, um, hopefully by next week. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about some of our upcoming classes next Tuesday and Wednesday. On Tuesday, we have um, Barbara Clark from Florida Public Archaeology Network doing at 1.30 online historic cemeteries as cultural resources. And she is the uh, expert in this area on cemeteries. She's really interesting. She knows a lot. Every time I listen to her, and I've heard her speak about them several times, I learn more. Uh, she knows all about symbolism and all kinds of things you never heard of, how to clean uh, gravestones if you have family cemeteries. And, and all kinds of interesting things. So um, please join her. She's a very good speaker. Uh, she did a, a class for me this week and uh, she, she's not like me, not a fan of teaching online, but it, it, you know, she's happy to share her knowledge. Um, and then on Wednesday, Barbara's colleague, Tristan Harrenstein is going to teach modeling historic headstones with photographs. And that, I, I think, is a really unique class. Where are you ever going to get to learn that? Um, it's, we often think of headstones as something that will last forever, but they will decay with time. The best method we have of preserving historic grave markers beyond their time is with software that turns photographs into 3D models. You can, all you need is a smartphone for this and you can learn how to turn your photographs into 3D models. I'm sure you can apply it to other things besides headstones. Um, but that's you know, really a unique opportunity to learn something that you couldn't learn from uh, Tristan. So um, I would encourage you, if that is something you might want to do, to sign up for that. Um, you can, for those two, you can email me and I will sign you up. Um, May the um, 12th, we have a four-week class by Tom Friedman, who's one of our very popular teachers. And he's, he's teaching, he's, he knows a lot about China. Um, he is a retired FBI agent and worked a lot with uh, the Chinese, and he's going to teach a class on modern China. It's called China Now, and that will be a four-week class. I believe for that week or, or sometime in May, later in May, we're going to be starting online registration. Hopefully, I'll have more information about that next week. And then on June 4th, we will have a four-week class starting um, called Florida at the Crossroads of Empire. 1513 to 1821, and that's being taught by um, Josh Goodman, Dr. Josh Goodman from the uh, State Archives, and he is a, he's a wonderful speaker. If you've never heard him speak, it's a real treat. He's very enthusiastic, and um, he just, we all, at the Senior Center, we all, he's one of our favorite speakers to have, so we're very lucky to have him uh, doing that, too, and um, so if you're interested in any of those, you can let me know. Um, for the June one, we should be on online registration, and I think the, the May one also. And there'll be more information on those coming out in the constant contacts and on our website. I just want to also mention if you um, would leave your, um, your, your microphones on mute unless you have a question so we don't get noise from other people's houses. I, I, I don't know who's unmuted, but I do hear... Um, noise from a few people's houses. So if you just could do that and, uh, and then feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, and I will now share my screen and try to get started with, with this. Nope, I'm not going to do the meeting. Okay, share screen. And... Okay, so this class, um, we're going to be, we're, we're talking about national parks from surface water. We um, started this a little bit last week. Um, 
and we we um, these parks are mostly with sedimentary rocks. So I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit about the sedimentary rocks. And I'll review a little bit from last week. Um, sedimentary rocks form from sediment weathered products. Um, and I'm not going to go over everything I did last week, but some examples of sedimentary rocks are shale. Sedimentary rocks tend to have fossils. Um, sedimentary rocks, um, the most common one is shale or mudstone. So there's a picture of, of shale with a uh, plant fossil. Um, sandstone, which of course comes from sand, like beach sand or a dune, and then conglomerate is uh, mixed up different sizes of particles. Limestone is also a sedimentary rock. Often it is uh, a chemical sedimentary rock that precipitates out of water. And I did go over all this last week, but I'm just going to, uh, I'm just reviewing a little bit. Um, strata is the most characteristic feature of sedimentary rocks, and this is an example of strata. It's a layering or bedding, and I think everybody's, most of you probably been to the Grand Canyon or at least seen pictures of it, so you know that, you know, the layers that you see in the, set, in the uh, rocks in the Grand Canyon are sedimentary strata. And then, of course, um, surface water, running water is the dominant agent of erosion. And it has shaped much of our physical environment and helped create some of these wonderful, beautiful parks that we have, um, you know, from surface water. And I just want to distinguish between weathering and erosion again. Weathering is breaking down the material um, by, you know, water, air, organisms. So it's breaking it down in situ or in place. And then erosion actually involves transport or carrying that material away. And that erosion is accomplished by either water, ice, or wind. And we're going to be looking at parks today that were, you know, eroded by water, running water. Um, I'm just jumping through some of these. Uh, so erosion involves transport, water, ice, or wind. And then we talked a little bit about geologic time. Um, and um, most of our... Um, Most of our, um, our dating in geology is done in relative dating. That's putting rocks in the proper sequence, but not necessarily giving them an age, an age date, because um, you can only do that if you have an igneous rock. And I don't want to get into that too much by radiometric dating is the only way you can really get an accurate date for a rock. But most of it's done by relative dating, and we have some different laws that we use to do that. Um, and this, one of the main laws that we use is superposition. And that is um, saying that the oldest layers are on the bottom and the youngest are on the top. Of course, this is the Grand Canyon, and it's showing you um, first a picture of it and then a diagram, and it's naming some of the beds of rocks, which we'll talk about a little more in a little bit. Um, and of course, showing you that, you know, the, these have not been deformed by folding or faulting or anything like that. So they're just, uh, you know, the strata are just the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on top. So as you're walking from the top to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you're getting into older and older rocks. I think this is about where I stopped last week. So I'm going to start putting it on slideshow mode because I'm not jumping through anymore and um, talk a little bit about unconformities. Because there isn't any place in the world where you have all the rocks from the beginning of geologic time to the present. You know, we talked about last week how the earth is about four and a half billion years old. And, um, you know, even someplace like the Grand Canyon, which does have very old rocks at the bottom. It does have Precambrian, very old uh, rocks at the bottom. And, and, um, but you know, it's not all the rocks from that Precambrian time to the present. There's always unconformities. And unconformities are breaks in the rock record caused by either erosion or non-deposition. So there's always going to be erosion going on. And it's going to remove some of the rocks or sediment that were laid down. And then there's just times when there isn't anything deposited. So this is always going to make a break, breaks in the geologic record. There's actually three types of unconformities. The first two are easy to identify. Uh, the first one, anybody could identify. You don't even have to be a geologist. The second one, if you can recognize rocks, it's also easy to identify. And then the third one um, 
the most common uh, the the uh, the most common type is um, very difficult to recognize. So I'm going to talk about all three of those. The easiest one to recognize is the angular unconformity, and we'll look at pictures of those. But that's where you have tilted rocks that have been deformed and they're tilted and they're overlain by flat lying rocks. So everybody would notice that if you saw that somewhere you would you might not know what it is but you would definitely notice it it's very easy to see the second easiest one to spot is actually the third one down here is the non-conformity and that's where you have igneous or metamorphic rocks with sedimentary rocks usually on top and on top of them so igneous or metamorphic with sedimentary on top um, if you can identify rocks um, you know th then that's pretty easy to identify also the third type, the disconform, that's called a non-conformity. The third type or the disconformity is where strata or rocks on either side of the unconformity are parallel. And those you can't really just look at it, not even a geologist can look at it and say there's an unconformity there. So and they're the most common type. So you would have to, to figure those out, you would have to use some other tool like possibly fossils, or if you had some igneous or metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks in, in the area, you might be able to use radiometric dating or something to figure out, and also maybe um, correlation, which we're going to uh, talk about later. So you have to use other things. These are, are much more tricky, and you have to be more like a geologic detective to figure out the disconformities. So here's the Grand Canyon, and again, in the Grand Canyon, even though, you know, it looks like, you know, these layers of rocks are, you know, they, oh, wow, they must have all the rocks from, you know, the really old ones to the youngest ones. There are lots and lots of missing sections, lots and lots of unconformities. This is, this is a diagram that shows how an angular unconformity may, might form. Um, if you have um, these layers of rocks that are deposited, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top, one through five, and then something happens. Maybe you have a plate boundary where you've got convergent plates that are converging and, and, and having that, um, you know, that pressure, that um, compressional forces, and it causes it to f upfold, the rocks to upfold. And then now they've been uplifted, so the ones at the top start getting eroded, carried away, maybe by water or something. And then later on, you might have sea level rise and then you have these other layers deposited seven eight and nine well now you can see there's an angle because the top of the fold was cut off by erosion there's an angle between the the layers on the bottom and on the top are flat so this surface here would represent an angular unconformity in real life this is a picture of an angular unconformity that i took this picture in uh, Nova Scotia in Canada. You can see the very thick layer at the top is flat lying, but underneath that you have those uh, tilted or angular layers. So even if you had no idea what the name of it was geologically, that's very easy to notice that that's something there. You know, you might say, oh, that's weird. That's odd. You know, why are these tilted and why is that on the top? Well, now you know that's an angular unconformity if you ever see one of those. Here's a cross section of the Grand Canyon, and we're going to talk about this uh, later when we get into details of the Grand Canyon. But you can see at, at the bottom, this is from the Grand Canyon Visitor Center, one of the visitor centers there. And you can see at the bottom, the Grand Canyon has an angular unconformity. And this is actually a very famous unconformity called the Great Unconformity. It was discovered by a very famous geologist named John Wesley Powell, and we're going to talk more about him too when we get into the Grand Canyon. And it's not, it's actually a double unconformity. So it's, it's really cool, at, you know, at least to a geologist. You can see here there's a, it's an angular unconformity. And then over here you have metamorphic rock, which is um, uh, the Vishnu schist, and then also there's a granite here. Um, uh, so it's, it's, I think it's called the Zoroaster, Gra Zoroaster Granite. So because you have this uh, granite and this metamorphic rock overlain by a sandstone, that's a non-conformity. So these are it's two, a double unconformity at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, a uh, angular unconformity and a non-conformity. So a, uh, this, is, this is a very, very famous unconformity actually it's called the great unconformity most of them don't have names so i'm going to talk a little bit about correlation because this is how they figure out 
how a rock layers go from one area to the next. And when we talk about um, the three parks that we're going to concentrate on today, um, Bryce Canyon and Zion Canyon and the Grand Canyon, um, we're, they figured out, you know, the, how they're connected by correlating the rock layers, matching rocks of similar age from one area to another. Um, this is very useful in the surface, uh, rocks that are actually at the surface. Um, and it's, it's useful in just being able to figure out, you know, how one area is related to another. It's also useful in the subsurface um, to geologists who are looking for resources like oil or natural gas or, uh, you know, mining, you know, sometimes me valuable metals or things like that. Um, actually, in my early career, I was a, um, a geologist for uh, Gulf Oil Corporation in Texas, and I used subsurface correlation all the time in my job because you can't see the rock layers that are beneath the surface. So you use um, well logs, which are, you know, uh, instruments that go down and take, you know, kind of measure the rocks. So you, you learn to read those. And then you also um, use seismic where they actually, um, you know, make these seismic um, lines of, of, of the area. And you use those tools to look at the subsurface to figure out, you know, where to look for, you know, natural resources that are at the subsurface. And they also use this even for drilling for water and things like that. So in Florida, more commonly that. But cor so correlation is a very important tool for geologists. And then I want to mention quickly, because I will be talking about some ages of rocks, the geologic time scale, and that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and the time scale divides the Earth's history into many units. And it was mostly created using relative dating. It was actually created um, back in the 1800s in England, um, and it was created using relative dates, because they didn't have the tools to do um, you know, radiometric dating back when it was first created. The oldest portion of the geologic time scale is kind of crammed down into the bottom. It's 85% of the Earth's history. It's called the Precambrian. And um, we only know a lot about the last 570 million years. So the other like 4 billion or so years on the bottom is all kind of crammed into this. There aren't a lot of fossils or even a lot of rocks you know, at the surface that we can study from the Precambrian. So, um, you know, we don't know a lot about it. So it's, you know, it is most of the Earth's history, but we concentrate in the geologic time scale on the last 570 million years. So this is your geologic time scale. And again, here's the Precambrian. And of course, that's, you know, not to scale because it's crammed down here and it's actually about 85% of the Earth's history. And then, um, you know, the, the eras, which you probably heard of, are the Paleozoic, and that's the Cambrian through the Permian, and, uh, and then the Mesozoic, the, in the middle area, the, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, of course, that's the age of the dinosaurs, and then um, the Cenozoic is the most recent, and that's about the last 65 um, million years, and that's divided into the tertiary, quaternary. We have them subdivided then. Um, so we will be talking, I'll be mentioning some of these uh, when I talk about some of the rock formations. Um, and it just gives you an idea of how old, you know, how long ago these things happened. And there were also mass extinctions. There was one at the end of the Paleozoic and the very famous one at the end of the Mesozoic that of course wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, so they kind of are divide, dividing lines for those too. Okay, now we're finally going to start to get into the parks now that we've covered some of the background stuff. Um, and I want to talk about the uplift of the Colorado Plateau because these parks that we're going to talk about today are up on the Colorado Plateau. And this was during the Eocene, I guess I can back up here. So this is all pretty recent. Um, the Colorado Plateau and the Rocky Mountains are actually geologically pretty young. Um, you know, 50, 55 million years seems like a long time to us, but actually it's it's very short time when you look at the whole 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. So, you know, this is all considered pretty recent geologically. So these are pretty young, um, young, it's a geologically young area. And this period of time we about during the Eocene, we had the um, Laramide orogeny. And that an orogeny is a mountain building event, and that's what built the modern Rocky Mountains. Now, 
think about where the Rocky Mountains are. You know, most of the mountain ranges that we talked about, we looked at the Ring of Fire a little bit when we were talking about plate tectonics. And um, most of the mountain ranges like, you know, um, in the west coast of the United States, the Cascades, we talked about that, uh, the Andes in South America, they're pretty near uh, the edge of the continent. Um, and we even talked about how you can sometimes get, you know, a subduction zone where you get the volcanic mountain range. Um, and then right at the um, subduction boundary, you might get another mountain range from that, uh, you know, accretionary wedge and the um, a deformation, uh, right, of the material that's going into the, the um, trench when you have an oceanic continental convergent boundary. But the Rocky Mountains, and when I first started learning plate tectonics, uh, this, this, seemed weird to me. I thought, well, it doesn't explain the Rocky Mountains because they're like, I don't know, about a thousand miles or so inland. I'm, I'm not sure exactly the distance, but it's, it's far. It's probably about 800, a thousand miles from the coast. So these don't kind of, they don't fit the, um, the normal, you know, what you think about for a subduction zone and forming a mountain range. They're odd. So how did they form? Well, it turns out that this is what they call low angle subduction. So I'm going to show a couple of videos about it and then talk about it, because this is kind of an unusual situation that created the Rocky Mountains and also the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. So I'm going to try to do a share for this two, uh, two different videos. So uh, take a minute to, for that to go on. So get it to work. OK, and I'm going to do a new share. So what do you do when your computer crashes and all those memories you've been storing for years are wiped out? On our journey south along the Rocky Mountains, we're entering a very different landscape. From Montana southward, the Rockies are made from ancient granite, 1.7 billion years old. Granite makes up much of the deepest part of the continental crust. That's why geologists call this rock the basement. The Canadian Rockies are built from sedimentary rocks piled up on top of the continental foundations. So why does granite suddenly appear here in the American Rockies? But there's an even greater puzzle. Mountains usually form close to plate boundaries, but the southern Rockies sit a long way from the plate margin. The Front Range in Colorado is a thousand miles from where the Pacific and North American plates actually meet. Geologists have come up with an explanation. They believe that the subducting Pacific Ocean plate is responsible. Ocean crust had been pushed deep into the mantle beneath North America for a hundred million years when something unusual happened. Plates rising from a hundred kilometers below the ocean's floor. Well, this is weird. This lava has flowed non-stop for 25 years. Sorry about that. That seemed to jump ahead or something. Advance is relentless and unpredictable, changing direction without notice. Try to get the new Roads here are regularly swept 
washed away, and some are now buried under 35 meters of rock. Twenty years, more than 200 homes have been destroyed by Kilauea's flow. And it doesn't stop here. Rivers of liquid rock plunge over the cliffs and into the water below. This is the front line in a battle between the elements. Plateau is a region of high elevation that slices through Arizona northwest to southeast, forming its northeastern border and extends into Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. Geologically, the Colorado Plateau is composed of many layers of mostly flat-lying sedimentary rocks. These layers largely consist of limestone and sandstone sequences indicative of transgressing and regressing shallow seas. After more than 300 million years of deposition from these shallow seas, the Laramide orogeny uplifted a large area of continental crust, giving the plateau its high elevation. These sedimentary layers are beautifully shown in the Grand Canyon and the mesas of Monument Valley. Much later, these sedimentary layers were overlain with relatively young volcanic activity. The most prestigious of these volcanic fields is the San Francisco Volcanic Field near Flagstaff, Arizona. The Colorado Plateau is host to a variety of landscapes. In the colorful badlands of the Painted Desert, Petrified Forest National Park is an amazing collection of 200 million year old petrified wood. The geologically young volcanic fields just north of Flagstaff are remnants of a more violent time in Arizona's history. Just east of there, Meteor Crater boasts one of the most pristine impact craters. The sandstone buttes of Monument Valley create an iconic landscape shaped by erosion. Of course, the most famous feature of the Colorado Plateau is the awe-inspiring Grand Canyon. The climate of the Colorado Plateau varies greatly due to extreme changes in elevation. However, temperatures are much cooler than the low deserts of the Basin and Range Province. Aside from the monsoons of late summer and early autumn, the Colorado Plateau is an extremely arid region, receiving less than 10 inches of precipitation annually in the mid to lower elevations. A large majority of the region is dominated by grassland and sagebrush. Most of the forests of the Colorado Plateau reside in the higher elevations near Flagstaff. Typical flora of these forests are the ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. Pinion pine, juniper trees, and a variety of cacti dot the landscape of the mid to lower elevations. The sedimentary layers of the Colorado Plateau are dotted with coal, uranium, and other hard rock mineral deposits. Copper and gold were some of the first minerals to be mined extensively on the plateau, while the development of nuclear weapons increased the level of uranium prospecting and mining throughout the region. Today, the Navajo power plant near Page features three 750 megawatt coal-fueled steam electric generating units. Water remains the most vital resource of the Southwest, and the Colorado River is arguably the most important water resource in Arizona. 
in an effort to control this resource, dams such as the Glen Canyon Dam and the Hoover Dam were constructed on the Colorado River in order to control floods, provide irrigation water, and produce hydroelectric power. The combination of a rich geologic history, inspiring landscapes, and important water and energy resources make the Colorado Plateau a truly special place in the American Southwest. Okay, uh, sorry about that first video that somehow it jumped ahead to another one. So uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure why I had that technical issue, but um, I guess you got some of the idea of the, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, the low angle subduction. So we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so the, um, the, actually the plate's name was the Farallon plate. And most of our plates actually, when they subduct, go down at a pretty high angle. But, but for some reason, this, uh, this plate had more of a flat type subduction. So it went, the uh, mountain building went much farther inland. So um, you had, and, and then the, also the scraping along of the, uh, of the plate underneath the continent also caused the uplift of the Colorado Plateau and some faulting in there. So this is kind of an unusual situation compared to what we have um, on Earth today for most of our mountain ranges form in a high angle subduction. But this is more of a flat or low angle type of subduction. Um, one of the geologic features uh, that encompasses the three parks we're going to concentrate on today is called the Grand Staircase. It's one of the region's most recognized geologic features um, where the uplift and erosion has exposed much of the Earth's history and has formed um, three of our most beautiful national parks. Um, so the top of the staircase, which has the youngest rocks, is Bryce Canyon National Park. The middle of the staircase, um, which has the uh, second youngest rocks, are Zion, is Zion Canyon. And um, that was carved by the Virgin River. Actually, Bryce Canyon was the, um, the features there were formed by um, um, weathering and differential erosions on areas that were just cracked and jointed. So we'll talk about how they were formed. Uh, Zion Canyon carved, carved, uh, was carved by the Virgin River in Zion Park. And then the oldest rocks are in the Grand Canyon. And of course, that was carved by the Colorado River. So this is kind of a cross section showing you the, the grand staircase. And, and Bryce Canyon, we're starting at the top of the staircase that has the, the youngest rocks exposed. Um, and then as you, these rocks have been removed by the time you get down to Zion. And so the, you know, the bottom of Bryce Canyon is the top of Zion, the Carmel Formation. And then when you get down even farther south to the Grand Canyon, these rocks have been removed. And now um, the, the, the uh, Kaibab, which is the bottom of uh, the, um, the uh, Zion National Park, in the bottom layers that are exposed. So that's the top of the Grand Canyon. Um, so you get to you know older and older rocks and then when you get down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon you're already down into Precambrian rocks very very old rocks this is another uh, cross section showing them a little more tilted so um, you know Bryce Canyon you've got uh, the youngest rocks and then into Zion and then into the Grand Canyon which is the oldest the Precambrian rocks down there so let's start with Bryce Canyon. And I mentioned Bryce Canyon was not formed by flowing water. Unlike the other two parks, it was not you know, carved by a river. It was actually when the Colorado Plateau was uplifted, um, there were cracks at the surface that formed some joints. And then you were able to get water and ice. Ice freezes at, you know, and thaws and when ice uh, when water freezes, it expands, which is actually very unusual. Most substances don't, um, you know, uh, expand when they freeze, but water does. So it, it, um, that freezing and thawing um, in, in the cracks breaks the rocks apart. And then the differential erosions is just that 
so they're softer and harder rock layers. And the softer layers will erode more, the harder layers will erode less. So you have wider areas and narrower areas, and you get these unique um, features, um, columns that have wide and narrow areas. And then some of the rocks contain iron and other different minerals that stain them beautiful colors. So these features are called the hoodoos. And if you've been to Bryce, you know the, what the hoodoos are. And they're absolutely really unique and cool and beautiful. And, um, and they, you know, that frost wedging, that freezing and thawing um, constantly in the cracks of the rocks breaks them apart. And then the different types of rocks, the limestone, dolomite, siltstone, and mudstone um, erode at different rates because some of them are harder and some of them are softer. The mudstone's the softest and that forms the narrowest portion of these uh, pinnacles that you see. So these are the hoodoos. Um, and then again, they, they have different colors because they get stained by different minerals that are in the rocks and they, you know, minerals get, you know, um, you know, broken down by water and then uh, stained. And um, in, it looks different in different times of the day, depending on the lighting. So you can get all kinds of really beautiful pictures of Bryce Canyon. You can see some of the layers and some of them are red and oranges and pinks and just really beautiful. The hikes there are fantastic. Um, I just loved hiking in this park because, you know, there's very little vegetation, so you can really get to see the rocks. Geologists love that. And then also, um, you know, you, you get to hike down through, uh, you know, through these like tunnels and, you know, columns and arches and things like that. So, you know, there's a little arch. It's my husband and I for scale. Um, and then I have a couple of video, uh, videos on the geology of Bryce and Zion. There's some really neat geologist rangers that are in these videos. So these are some of my favorite. Hopefully this one will work well when I share the screen. Okay, let me give you a share. There is nothing more magical than a sunrise at Bryce Canyon. As the morning rays creep over the canyon's famous hoodoos, these layers that make these colorful hoodoos at Bryce Canyon were deposited in a freshwater lake only about 40 million years ago. And much of the modern landscape was coming into existence when the rocks at Bryce Canyon were laid down. A lot of people really like these colorful hoodoos at Bryce because you're very intimate with them when you go there. The park is not large. It's easy to get close to all of the features at Bryce and sometimes you get this reflected light back onto the hoodoos and it makes them almost come alive for people when they visit there. So how did these hoodoos come to be? At the time, these ancient lakes existed. This area of the Colorado Plateau was a giant basin and although water could flow in, there were no rivers to carry the water out. Instead, sediment forming at the bottom of the lakes just kept building up. Yeah, well, actually we get the request again. Kevin Poe, affectionately called the singing geologist, gives talks at Bryce. He compares the sediment to the residue in a bottle containing an instant orange drink. Tang. Sediment. Yes, of course. Okay. So here we are on the top of Dutton's Grand Staircase, which he called the Pink Cliffs, which is, I mean, you know, was the guy colorblind? I mean, come on, this is orange, right? Uh, well, it wasn't that he was colorblind. It's just that Dutton never really got very close, as it turns out. When you look at the same layer of rock, clear out on the horizon there, there's the Powell Point, named for Dutton's boss, John Wesley Powell. Uh, and you'll see when you have to look through all that atmosphere disturbance, the rock does kind of turn pink. But when you're sitting right on top of it, it's orange, because, of course, that was the ingredient iron in this lake system, right? And you know, and it wasn't tang, it was limestone, but limestone like sugar does completely dissolve in water up until the saturation point. And so with this lake, more and more limestone being added, kind of like the tang attic, eventually you start to get the sediment forming at the bottom. And instead of orange 47 or whatever the heck this artificial color is, it was the iron that mixed in there to give it that beautiful color. Now the rest of the story is that the Colorado Plateau finally begins to rise. When it rises, it rises so that what was a lake basin before gets turned wrong side out. 
You know, it gets lifted up high, so now the lake drains, and all that ooze left behind could lithify to become the rock and the limestone that is Bryce Canyon. And as I kind of look through your faces here in the audience today, I can see that pretty much none of you really care about that. <laughs> and uh, that's okay, because they make me say all that stuff at the beginning about how the rock forms. But come on, I know what's really going on. The reason why you pay $25 to get in here is not to know about how the rock formed, but to celebrate how the rock is being destroyed, right? That's what makes us special. Because first of all, we're not even a real canyon. What do you, what do you got to have to be a real canyon? A river. Yeah, you got to have a river running through it. And even in a torrential downpour, you know, just water falling from the sky, buckets and buckets, um, we get a little tiny creek at the bottom. But as soon as the rain stops, well, the creek soaks into the ground, and that's it, okay? What you see out there is carved by water, but it's not flowing water. It's the freezing and thawing of water, frost wedging. So imagine that rock out there with all the different cracks in it. You could take my hand here and pretend it's one of these fins, one of these walls that sticks out. And of course, it has cracks like the gaps between my fingers. And now you put some snow on top of it. And so let's say that it's like January, okay? Um, and because even though it's really cold at night, for several hours during the afternoon, it's above freezing. So that snow melts and has water, it trickles down inside the cracks. And then later at night when it freezes, what happens? It expands, good, as water turns to ice, it expands. But it, it also does something else. And it does, because think about it this way, when water boils, it also expands. But when water freezes, it expands and gets hard. Who said that? I heard it somewhere. Hard. Yeah, exactly right. My old mean geology professor used to give us a zero on the entire exam if you didn't remember get hard. And then, and then what he would say is um, decrease your density and get harder. Think about that for a minute, right? There's only one substance in the universe that can do that, and that's water. And that was the point he was trying to make, a spectacular process to, you know, expand and yet get harder. And so as water does this, it starts forcing apart holes in the rock. Eventually, that hole becomes so large, it can no longer support its weight, and the roof caves in, and the delicate, sticky-up things on either side, that's a hoodoo. That's, that's how they form. And those hundreds upon thousands of them you see out there were different parts of cracks and holes in rocks and now stand by themselves. So one last song about the ultimate fate of my beloved Bryce Canyon in the loose tradition of Peter, Paul, and Mary. <clears throat> Where will all the hoodoos go? Long time weathering. Where will all the hoodoos go? Three million years from now. Where will all the hoodoos go? East Severe River will tear them down. Now you have learned, now you have learned about the Bryce Rocks. My name is Ranger Poe, and thanks for coming out and rocking today. The middle step in the Grand Staircase is Zion National Park. A park that encompasses some of the most scenic canyon country in the United States. It is characterized by high plateaus, a maze of narrow, deep sandstone canyons, and striking rock towers and mesas. A lot of people who visit the Colorado Plateau think of Zion as being their favorite national park. And probably one of the reasons for that is because of all the great canyons that we have as national parks here on the Colorado Plateau. Zion is the only one where you stand next to the road at the bottom of the canyon and you look up to the rims on either side. Most of our national parks is where you look from the top and you look down at a very tiny river. But in Zion National Park, you can actually be in the heart of the canyon and you can see these fantastic walls of Navajo sandstone rising up both sides of your, your vehicle. You know, when you're down there at Zion, you see the beautiful towering white cliffs. One of the things you'll notice right away is the rocks don't have, their, well, they're weird. Instead of having nice flat lines in all that sedimentary rock the way sedimentary rock is supposed to be, what they have are these bizarre angles, right? You'll see a bunch of 15 degree angles stacked on top of each other for a while, and then maybe above those, some 30 degree angles for a while, and then some 15s and some 30s going all the way up the top of these huge towering cliffs. 
If you can find the right place, the intersection, where you see those 15s meeting a 30 like this, this should remind you of something. Because Mother Nature only ever makes one thing with this shape and cross section. And, and your big hint is it's made of sand. So, so what are we talking about here? What is this? Sand dune, exactly right, yeah. And be, because the physics of a sand dune is pretty simple. Basically, it's all about how hard it is to blow sand uphill, okay? You know, if you don't believe me, try it, right? That's what science is all about. Just, <laughs> the best you'll ever do is maybe about 15 degrees blowing those little grains uphill. And if we were to, there's not a lot of wind, but let's say the wind's coming this way towards us, okay? So then the shape of the sand dune would be something like this, because the little grains, they'd go uphill, but once they get over the top of the slip face, once they're protected from the wind, then they can stick to each other up to about 30 degrees. And that's how you get that shape of a sand dune. Whether it's a sand dune in the Sahara Desert today, or a sand dune in a gigantic desert that was centered on this region about 200 million years ago. So here we've got the land now as a desert. Great big ocean of sand centered on the Utah region here. And uh, what you can see is that, you know, the whole Utah's covered. It's spreading out in different areas. And um, it's not that the wind blew continually the same direction over and over again. So they're not individual dunes that are gigantic tall, but they're dunes stacked on top of dunes. So, you know, if you were to imagine maybe for a few million years, the prevailing wind comes from the south. So you'd have a bunch of dunes that have this orientation. But then if the winds and then come from the north, well, they'd flatten those off underneath and build new sand dunes that go this way. And then maybe, you know, over here from the east and then over here from the west, all the way up stacking sand dunes on top of sand dunes until eventually it all lithifies and it turns to rock and that's how you get the sandstone the white cliffs and build new sand dunes that go this way and then maybe you know over here from the east and then over here from the west all the way up stacking sand dunes on top of sand dunes until So how did you like the singing geologist? Hopefully everybody liked him. I, th I, th I think he's great. He was great. <laughs> Very entertaining. I loved him. <laughs> Very good. Creative. Good. Um, okay, so we'll get into talking a little bit about Zion. Now you had an introduction to Zion. Um, the oldest sediments were deposited in what is known as the Permian Sea, which covered a lot of the uh, you know, middle and western part of the, um, the North American continent during the, the Permian, um, which is the end of the Paleozoic. Um, and those deposits became the, what's known as the Kaibab limestone, which you may have uh, heard of because that's at the top of the Grand Canyon. And one of the trails you can hike on at the Grand Canyon is called the Kaibab Trail. So some of you may have been on that sometime. Um, and then thick sediments were deposited near sea level about 175 million years later, and that became the Colorado Plateau. And then in the video, he talked about the Jurassic Navajo sandstone. Now we're in the Mesozoic. The Jurassic's the middle of the Mesozoic, and that formed from uh, Aeolian, which is windblown sand dunes, like he said in the video. It was, it was like, you know, that part of North America was like the Sahara Desert is now. You have these giant sand dunes and they exhibit cross bedding because that reflects the changes in the wind direction. And you can really see the cross bedding great in the Navajo sandstone. The, the best example of that in Zion is the feature called Jack Checkerboard Mesa. And you can really see that. And that's one of the, um, the big sites that you, you view when you go to Zion National Park. So I should have a picture of that. Um, Zion is also famous for its arches. And this um, shows how, you know, from the uplift, and there's actually salt underneath that, and salt, you know, the, it kind of expands and then causes the cracking of the sandstone that's above that, uplifts it, and, um, and it dissolves in, the, it gets in the cracks, the water in the environment gets in the cracks, dissolves it, and then forms these fins like they were talking about. And then um, the fins eventually will erode and form an arch. And then eventually the arch will cave in. So the, all those features that you see in Zion, all those arches that you see are not gonna you know, be there forever. They'll finally you know, collapse eventually. Now this is a, um, a map of Zion. 
And if you visit there, there's actually got two areas to visit. So if you want to see the largest arch, that's the Kolub Arch, that's up in this uh, northwestern region of the park, and that's got its own visitor center, its own entrance. And then the main part of the park is down here, and that's where you see all of the other features, like uh, the actual canyon, Zion Canyon of the river, and and um, the um, weeping rocks, and the uh, checkerboard mesa, and everything is over in this part. This is the main part. But if you go there, you also want to see the Kolo Arch because that's pretty neat, also in the in this area, and also a very beautiful area of the park. This is the um, the geologic section of the uh, rocks in Zion. And you can again see the Navajo sandstone. It's Jurassic. It's very, very thick. You know, that desert was there for a long time, formed those sand dunes. And then, um, you know, the bottom of it is the, you know, the Kaibab limestone. So you're seeing the very top of the Permian. You're seeing some Triassic and uh, a little bit of Cretaceous. But most of it, most of the rocks that you're seeing are Triassic and, and Jurassic rocks. Um, Question on on that previous slide, what what does the thickness of each layer determine uh, indicate the hardness of the rock? No, it's just how long it was there. This was there okay. a long time. It's a very not, thick layer, so it's not, not the height. I mean the left to right dimension. So the Navajo sandstone. Oh yes, yeah, you're right. That's absolutely right. Yes, yes. How okay. much it erodes, the hardness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Zion, Zion Canyon is cut by the uh, Virgin River. And what's neat, like he was saying in the video, what's neat about this park is you can actually walk in the canyon. You can actually, some of it is actually in the, the river. Most of the time doesn't have a lot of water in it. So you can walk you, um, either, I think when I was there, I had sandals on because it was the summer and you can actually walk in the water in some areas. However, you have to be careful when you're hiking here because these are very narrow canyons, and if it does rain, and they do have some, you know, like, you know, quick uh, thunderstorms that come up pretty quick, the canyons fill up very quickly with, and very uh, rapidly with water, and people do drown in these kind of canyons because it doesn't, the water doesn't have anywhere to go, really, and it just fills up. So you have to check the weather, um, uh, you know, forecast, but it's a really neat hike to hike through the Zion Canyon, uh, especially the narrows. It, I, um, it really demonstrates the erosive power of the river. It's a few feet wide, but the cliffs are 2,000 feet high. So it's amazing to kind of walk through there and, you know, look up. It makes you feel, feel very small. And then the Great Arch is a blind arch that they have in this, and this is all in that southern part of the um, Park, the Narrows, the Great Arch. The Kolub Arch is in that northwestern part of the park, and that's the largest freestanding arch in the world. Very impressive. And then they also have weeping rocks there where um, there's a bedding plane between two types of rocks. And if you have an, a permeable rock and an impermeable rock on top of it, uh, you know, the uh, permeable or on the bottom of it, uh, the, you know, the permeable rock will flow, you know, will have the water flowing through it. And it looks like the rock is actually weeping. I think I have a picture of that. So that's some of the cliffs in Zion. This is that, uh, the narrow is part of that canyon. And like I said, you're actually walking through the water. Um, so you either, if you go to the, do this, you either want to have in the summer, if you have like hiking sandals or boots, you know, the water is not very deep, but you can, if you have a, a flash flood from a thunderstorm, it can fill up, you know, and again, these are about 2000 feet high. So very impressive. Um, this is the blind arch. That's the great arch. It doesn't go all the way through. And then that is the cola arch, the largest freestanding arch in the world. Very impressive. Um, and then over here, you can see the weeping rock, the, you know, the areas that in the, you know, along the bedding plains where you have a, you know, an impermeable rock or that kind of flows out like a spring. And um, this is just, he talked a little bit about the formation of dunes and, you know, they're about 15 degrees and, you know, like it's the wind blowing the sand uphill and it, so it's a pretty low angle. And then, you know, you get this, you know, slip base where some of it will, will fall down. So eventually the dunes will migrate. This is a picture of great sand dunes. 
and um, that this is a diagram that kind of shows it, like he was demonstrating, you know, try blowing sand uphill, well, that's what the wind does, and it gets up to a certain point, and then it exceeds the angle of repose and falls down on the other side. So dunes actually migrate, and this is showing you how, you know, a dune will migrate, they, they don't stay in one place. Um, you know, vegetation will sometimes help protect them from migrating, you know, as quickly, so. Um, and this is this is showing you cross bedding, and this is in an actual you know a, a living dune, a, du a living dune or a dune that has been turned into rock, you know, a, um, a modern day dune that is uh, you know you see the different angles you know that shows the different uh, shifting wind directions. And then this is checkerboard mesa, one of the really impressive uh, features in um, in uh, Zion. And again, you know, th this picture, this is, you know, a, you know, a giant desert area like the modern day Sahara Desert. And this was one of the big dunes and you can see the, the cross bedding really well, you know, and the changing directions in this, the changing wind directions. Okay, now we're getting to the bottom of the Grand Staircase or the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. Um, if you want to know its dimensions, it's about a mile deep, but about between nine and 18 miles wide. And of course it was cut by the Colorado River. And, and, and the rocks in the Grand Canyon are old. They go all the way down to some Precambrian rocks at the bottom. They're mostly Paleozoic. So they're you know, like, they're the old, this is the bottom of the Grand Staircase. You're getting to the oldest rocks. You know, they were Mesozoic in the, um, in, in uh, Zion, but now you're down in the Grand Canyon, so you're starting with the Paleozoic rocks and going all the way down to Precambrian. So um, the rocks exhibit two billion years of geologic history. There's lots of unconformities, but the canyon itself is, is young. It was only carved in, uh, in the last two million years or so, which is a, you know, a drop in the bucket you know, in geologic time. Very, very, very short. Um, and even the oldest rocks, even though the Grand Canyon has Precambrian pre rocks at the bottom, even the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon are still less than half of the age of the Earth, because the Earth is over 4 billion years old. Um, in the Grand Canyon, the uh, limestones are the cliff formers, so there will be the ones like you were asking about the, the width of it on a geologic section, there'll be the ones that would be wider, and the shales are, are the ones that go in and form the gentle slope. So they would be the ones that would be narrower on the geologic, you know, if you saw the, the, um, the this geologic section of the rocks. The sandstones, depending on what the sand is made up of, are variable. And, you know, if it's quartz sand, they can be very, very, um, you know, um, hard and durable. But if it's, uh, you know, like a feldspar or another less uh, durable mineral than the sandstones can be, uh, have also the gentle, gentler slopes. Um, there's one of the views of the Grand Canyon from the South Rim. And I do have a couple of videos which are also kind of entertaining. At least one of them is on the Grand Canyon. This first one is entertaining. The second one is kind of a, it's a flyover of the Grand Canyon, which is kind of interesting to talk about some of the different areas. So hopefully they'll work well. I always keep my fingers crossed with the technology. Too great for the eye to behold. But how is it made, and why is it here in northern Arizona and nowhere else? These are questions that visitors often ask me. Isn't it human nature to wonder about our planet's early history? I'm going to give you one perspective. In this Ranger Minute, I'm going to give you an easy way to remember how the Grand Canyon was shaped over time. All you have to remember is D U D E. And to do this, I'm going to use a high-tech visual aid here to help me out. Books. The first D stands for deposition. The first 4,000 feet of rock on top that we see here, these are sedimentary rocks. Rocks deposited in ecosystems far different than what we see today. 
at one time, oceans came in here and covered the land with water and deposited sediments, lots of tiny particles. And then the oceans receded and wind-blown sand sediments were deposited. Then when the oceans came back again, more sediments were deposited. Lots of different types, too. Some thick layers, some thin layers, different colors as well. Many different sediments. And these sediments solidified into the rocks. Now, I said many of these sediments were deposited underwater. I'm not underwater right now, am I? Here at Lippin Point, I'm over 7,000 feet above sea level. So if D stands for deposition, U stands for uplift. This area, known as the Colorado Plateau, which comprises the Four Corners region of the United States, lifted up high and flat. You cannot have a Grand Canyon unless the rocks lift up high and flat. And then, the next D stands for downcutting. About five million years ago, along came the Colorado River. And it's this river that's singularly responsible for D downcutting. Cutting down into the Colorado Plateau, revealing millions of years of the Earth's history in the layers of these rock walls. But Ranger Felgenhauer, the river, it's, it's only about 300 feet wide. I thought I heard the Grand Canyon's over 10 miles wide. So was the river ever 10 miles wide? Nope. So what happened here? Where did the rest of the stuff go? Did a glacier come in here and scoop everything out? Nope. What about earthquakes? Separating this along massive fault lines? No. So what does that E stand for? Erosion. What kind of erosion? Wind erosion? No. Water! Rain and ice and the freezing and thawing of snow and ice, cracking these rocks, breaking them, and then gravity pulling all of this erosional debris downhill and downriver, widening the canyon over time, revealing this stair-step topography that we see here today. Let's review. D, deposition. U, uplift. D, downcutting. E, erosion. I'm Ranger Felgenhauer, and may this curiosity that led you to click on this Ranger Minute lead you to new learning opportunities and great discoveries. Continue exploring. Okay, um, this second video, I'm not going to show the whole thing because it's pretty long, but I'm going to show some of it because it, it's, a, it's you know, like a simulated flying through the Grand Canyon. But it does show some of the interesting areas. Um, it gives you an, kind of a good overview. Entering on the left, we see the Little Colorado River. At this point, 
point, the main Colorado River turns west, carving through the Kaibab uplift, exposing both the reddish-pink supergroup rocks and the dark rocks of the Inner Gorge. reaches elevations over 9,000 feet. As we pass, note the Kaibab monocline, which forms the eastern edge of the Kaibab uplift. We return to the river by way of Crystal Creek. In 1966, a large storm caused a debris flow to surge down Crystal Creek and empty into the Colorado River creating overnight one of the toughest rapids on the river. Ahead is Powell Plateau, an erosional remnant of the North Rim named for John Wesley Powell, who, in 1869, was the first explorer to survey and map the canyon from one end to the other. At Powell Plateau, the character of the canyon changes. Here, the Esplanade Sandstone, one of the Paleozoic rock layers, forms a wide, red rock bench within the canyon. Fossils in the Paleozoic rocks provide evidence of the region's dynamic geologic history. Shellfish, coral, reptile tracks, and fern fossils reveal that ancient oceans, deserts, and swamps once existed here. On the left is Havasu Creek. This creek is famous for its blue-green water, stunning waterfalls, and travertine pools. This is the traditional home of the Havasupai, or people of the blue-green waters, who still occupy the canyon today. Further downriver, we approach Vulcan's Throne, the remnant of an ancient volcano. Beginning 630,000 years ago, lava poured forth over the canyon rim from volcanoes such as this, damming the river at least 13 times. Each time the river was blocked, water collected behind the dams. Eventually, the weight and pressure... trending faults that cut across the canyon. The Hurricane Fault was originally active during the Precambrian era, but has been reactivated numerous times since. Like fossils, faults provide insight into Grand Canyon's complex geologic history. Separation Canyon, so named because it was here that three of John Wesley Powell's men left the expedition in 1869, never to be seen again. Long before Powell visited the canyon, prehistoric peoples were living along the river. Rock art, cliff dwellings, and potsherds serve as evidence of their presence here. Additionally, caves throughout the canyon contain the remains of large Ice Age mammals, such as giant ground sloth, camels, mastodon, and horses. The discovery of Clovis-style spear points indicates that Ice Age hunters also dwelled within the canyon's walls 12,000 years ago. Our 277-mile journey through Grand Canyon ends abruptly at the Grand Wash Cliffs. As we pull away, the full spectacular length of this grandest of all canyons on Earth comes into view once again. The geologic story of this impressive feature is complicated, but with each day we learn something new. As time passes, the aged rocks will continue to be eroded. Although we can only imagine how this feature will appear in the next million years, its value as a geologic and visual masterpiece is apparent, and we will continue to protect it for generations to come. Did anybody catch the error in the beginning of that second video?
Nobody? Well, good. I was worried about showing it that people might catch it. She said, she said, um, billion years that the canyon was carved over the last five, I think, billion years, and it should have been million. It was, it was, uh, she may have actually said it right, but on the closed captioning, it said billion, and that's wrong. <laughs> so, um, anyway, well, good. Nobody, nobody noticed that. Um, Okay, so they went through some of this in the video, but we'll talk a little bit about the geologic history of the Grand Canyon. Um, there was the accumulation of early uh, pre-Cambrian sedimentary rocks, that's the oldest rocks, and then evidence of ancient mountain building, igneous intrusion, of, um, igneous, some igneous rocks, um, and then uplift, these early pre-Cambrian rocks were uplifted, underwent erosion, you know, creating some unconformities. And then you have the, um, later you have the deposition of the rocks called the Grand Canyon Super Group. And then that was followed by faulting, you know, in that flyover, she showed you some faults. And, and then there's uh, that, I mentioned this earlier in the talk today, that great unconformity, which was discovered by uh, John Wesley Powell, who um, a very famous geologist from the 1800s. And, and it's a non-conformity, which means it's um, igneous and metamorphic rocks coming into contact with sedimentary rocks on top, plus an angular unconformity because, you know, you had that uplift in erosion. Um, yeah, and then um, later on, you had deposition above that. So that helped create that, um, those two unconformities, which are the great unconformity. So there's a, a picture of it. You know, you have the evidence of the Precambrian rocks, which were uplifted eroded and then um, you had some also some igneous uh, intrusion in there and that creates the uh, great unconformity in between um, you know those Precambrian rocks and then the Cambrian uh, Tapeat sandstone. And I wanted to talk a little bit about John Wesley Powell. Here's a couple of pictures of him. Um, he was a, a Civil War veteran who lost an arm in the Civil War, but that didn't stop him from later on going on horseback to explore a large part of the American West. So he was a, a geologist. He was a soldier and an explorer of the American West. He did lose most of his right arm in the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. Um, he was known for studying rocks when he was in uh, the Vicksburg uh, battles, he would actually spend his time in the trenches studying the rocks, which is, you know, typical of a geologist. We, we don't, we are always looking at the rocks, no matter what we're doing. Um, and explored, he explored the Grand Canyon in many areas of the West. He was um, also the second director of the United States Geological Survey. Um, so he had a long uh, career. He was also an expert on the native people there. So I put that picture in there because I think that's, that's really cool old picture. Um, uh, um, and I'm going to show a short video on him because I think he's really interesting. Um, John Wesley Powell had been a Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Back to the beginning. John Wesley Powell had been a Union officer in the Civil War and was wounded so severely that his right arm had to be amputated. In 1869, he and a small group of brave men made the first known boat trip through Grand Canyon. Before Powell, no white man had ever returned from a trip on the Colorado River. Powell's purpose was to make a scientific survey of the canyons of the Green and Colorado Rivers. This was unknown country then, an empty area on contemporary maps. The Powell expedition set out from the Union Pacific's Green River Station in Wyoming Territory on May 24, 1869. In describing an area within the present park, Powell wrote, Once more the walls close in, and we find ourselves in a narrow gorge the water again filling the channel and being very swift. There were calmer stretches of river between the rapids, and the party found sandy banks where they could pull their boats ashore. The men set up camp, ate sparingly from their dwindling food supply, and rested from their work of fighting the angry waters. 
At several points, Powell and some of his team climbed up the rugged rock walls to the canyon rim. This was not an easy task for a man with one arm. Three of the party, exhausted and fearing unknown terrors yet to come, left the group. The three men vanished without a trace. Powell persevered in his scientific studies, making detailed measurements of elevations and distances and analyzing the vast array of geologic data he assembled. In his publications later, his gift for elegant wording and his respect for the wonders of the canyon appear on every page. The traveler on the brink, he wrote, looks from afar and is overwhelmed with the sublimity of massive forms. The traveler among the gorges stands in the presence of awful mysteries, profound, solemn. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed that. I, I think John Wesley Powell is really interesting. Um, and again, we I want to mention that there, you know, the unconformities that I talked about in the beginning. Um, there's a lot of uh, the, in, you know, the presence of all the unconformities indicates the uplift and the erosion in the Grand Canyon. And the numerous unconformities include that great unconformity at the bottom that was discovered by John Wesley Powell. And it's really cool to a geologist because it's a double type of unconformity, an angular unconformity, you know, where the rocks are at an angle with each other and a non-conformity, the igneous and metamorphic um, rocks that come in contact with the sedimentary rocks on top. So that's an actual picture of the grand, great unconformity. I've actually never been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I've only hiked partly down twice, so I've never gotten to see this in person, but um, it would be really cool to do. So if you, if you have, you're very lucky. Um, I've never taken a raft trip through the Grand Canyon. I suppose if you do that, you could, you could see it then. Um, so the geologic history, uh, as we're getting up towards the younger rock, then you have the Cambrian rock. Um, that was a transgressing sea. You hear about transgressing, which is seas coming in and then the sea going away for a while. That's a regressing sea. Um, so there's another unconformity between the Cambrian rocks and then the Devonian rocks that they find later. There's some section missing. Um, and then there's Mississippian red wall limestone, which is a shallow marine type of, uh, type of environment. And then there's um, the Surprise Canyon formation, which actually um, shows evidence of channel deposits. So there were some rivers there, either that or underwater uh, channels under ocean, but probably rivers and channel deposits. And then we get into the younger, the Pennsylvanian and early Permian um, Supai group. Then it was a swamp in that area. So again, the sea must have been regressed at that time. And then uh, later on the withdrawal of the Permian Sea completely. And then you have a, just a floodplain deposition of in the Mesozoic of sandstones and shales. So you're going up through. And again, that's these are the different rocks. I was just talking about some of the different formations. And again, here's the great unconformity at the bottom with the Tapit sandstone on top. Um, this is the brochure. I'll just share that real quick from the Grand Canyon, um, which you can get online, which I really like that you can get the, um, the National Park, you know, brochures online. So if you're going to a park, you can, you can get this and read about it ahead of time. And it has some really good pictures in this. This is what I wanted to point out. This is the Vishnu Schist, which is, you know, one of the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon. So um, that, that is actually a Precambrian. So that's, that's at the bottom, obviously. And then this is showing you, um, this is a, uh, a trilobite fossil um, that's in the bright angel shale, and that would be Cambrian because trilobites lived in the ocean. They're extinct, obviously, and they lived during the Paleozoic, you know, around the Cambrian. So, and there's lots of different varieties of trilobites. So they were a marine organism that swam in the ocean, um, but they're really cool fossils. Um, 
so they do find fossils in the rocks. So um, let's see if we can get this out of here. Okay, and then there's some pictures of the Grand Canyon that is, uh, I think that has a name like the ship or something like that. I can't remember. And then this is looking down and you can see some of the formations. This is the, from the south rim. And then the, that's marked, that's if you're standing on the south rim at the top, you're standing on the Kaibab limestone. And there's two trails that you can hike down from the south rim or hike, hike down one and up the other, the Kaibab Trail and then the Bright Angel Trail. So the Kaibab Trail is named for the formation Kaibab Limestone and the Bright Angel Trail is named for the Bright Angel Shale. Um, and then there's one of the mule trips that would be fun to do. Although I think uh, you're, um, they, what they do is they go down on the mule, they spend the night down at the bottom and then they come back up on the mule. I s imagine your rear end would be pretty sore <laughs> after doing that for two days, but um, that's always neat. And when you're hiking in the Grand Canyon, you always see them there. They, that's on the Kaibab Trail. And then this is the contact between the, uh, on the Bright Angel Trail between the Coconino Sandstone, which is a very thick sandstone formation, and the Hermit Shale, which is below that. So um, that's two of the formations. And then again, um, you know, the shales tend to be, you know, the, um, the ones that get eroded more easily. So the, you know, the, the sandstone is more resistant, the cliff former, and the shales are tend to be eroded back more. And then one of the interesting things when I was there last time I learned was that they, um, they had uh, introduced some juvenile California condors. I went on a ranger talk and they were talking about that in, uh, into the Grand Canyon. And, and at that time, which was several years ago, they were doing very well. Um, and I got a picture of it, but of course it's from very far away. So it's not a great picture, but that's kind of neat since they, uh, the California condors were very endangered. And then I have never been to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. The two or three times I've been to the Grand Canyon, it was always on the South Rim. Um, the North Rim has that skywalk, um, which apparently you, you know, so you see through the clear bottom. I've talked to people that have done it and they said it's kind of scary, um, but I've, I've never done it. So um, I'm not sure quite how I feel about, you know, building something like that on something so, you know, beautiful as the Grand Canyon, but it's there. So, um, and then a couple of other things I wanted to cover real quickly, because um, in the early, I have about five minutes, um, our, our me meteor crater is also out in this area. And this is kind of interesting. Um, so meteors, um, I've also visited me meteor crater. It's not a national park, but they are called meteors when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, um, a meteorite when they found, find it on Earth. And uh, there's different types of meteorites. There's iron meteorites, which are mostly iron. There's stony meteorites, which are mostly silicate, like silicate minerals. So it's more like a rock, you know, on Earth, you know, silicate rock. And then um, kind of like a granite type thing. And then uh, stony irons, which are mixtures of the two. And then there's the really uh, the most uh, rare type are the carbonaceous crondites, which are unique and neat because they have actually um, amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. So that, um, you know, if this comes from space, that tells us that there might be life somewhere else. Um, and then the reason I was talking about meteorites, because I wanted to mention Meteor Crater in Arizona, because when you go to the Grand Canyon, it's not that far to go to the Meteor Crater, and I would highly recommend it. It's, it's not a national park, it's privately owned, but it's a really cool place to go. Um, it's one mile across, it's about um, 2.4 miles in circumference. Circumference. It's uh, 550 feet deep, and it's also known as the Barringer Crater because that's the person who discovered it. It's um, 50,000 years old, which is very young geologically. So the meteorite that came and hit that area um, occurred about 50,000 years ago. That's when that happened. And the meteorite mostly vaporized. So this person, Daniel Barringer, that discovered it, he uh, was a miner. He was actually from Philadelphia, where I'm from. So I think that's kind of neat. And he um, decided that he was going to buy up this area. Everybody at that time thought it was volcanic, but he decided it was from a meteorite. And he thought he was going to find this really, uh, you know, rich deposit of iron underneath the crater. 
That's why he bought it up. He bought it up and he thought he was going to get rich from this great, you know, iron deposit. Um, and there's the crater. And he sent his miners in there and they mined it and they never did find a big deposit of iron because it mostly vaporized. He didn't realize that. But he was the type that, you know, took a lemon, you know, and turned it into lemonade. And his family opened, say his family still owns the uh, Meteor Crater and they opened it as a tourist attraction. So um, it's very interesting. They've trained astronauts there before they went to the moon. And this is showing um, the crater, you know, with the lip of a little bit of debris, the rock that came out and how the rock was fractured. And then it shows you some of the rocks, you know, the, the sediment, you know, the, the, I mean, the layers of strata. It's the same rocks that you see at the Grand Canyon, the Kayabat limestone, the Coconino sandstone. So this is in the same region. Um, this is the largest piece of iron of the iron meteorite they found. It's called the Holsinger meteorite. It's the largest fragment that was found, me there for scale. That's in the museum. Um, and then this is another meteorite that they found um, from that same crater at Canyon, Canyon Diablo. That's the area, it's what it's called in Arizona. That's another large piece of iron. Um, I'm not going to show this video, but in uh, I got my master's degree at Texas Christian University. And these are pictures of the Moaning Meteorite Museum at Texas Christian University, which um, the first curator was one of my um, advisors uh, when I was in graduate school. And we went back and visited this so uh, maybe eight or nine years ago. And he took us on a private tour. Um, of the of the it's a really fantastic um, meteorite museum. So if you were ever in Fort Worth, you can go to this museum. It's on the campus of Texas Christian University. It was it's called the Monig Meteorite Museum because it was donated by a gentleman named Oscar Monig, who was had the largest private collection of meteorites in the world. He owned the Monig's department store chain in Texas. Um, he um, when he passed away, he didn't have any children. His wife had died before him. So he left his collection of meteorites and all his money to TCU to build this meteorite museum. This is from the museum and it shows a picture of the KT layer, which is, um, is the evidence of the enormous meteorite that hit Earth 65 years, million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous and of course uh, caused the mass extinction, which included the dinosaurs. So they have, a, they have a piece of that. And then if you were ever worried, I love this slide. This is also from the TCU Museum. If you were ever worried about getting hit by a meteorite, it is something that could happen. This lady's name was Ann Hodge. She was asleep on her couch in Talladega, Alabama, which isn't that far from Tallahassee, when a meteorite crashed through her roof and bounced off her hip. And that was on November 30th, 1954. There's the meteorite. Actually, Mr. Monig owned that meteorite. He purchased it in his and had it in his collection. And you can see the, the bruise on her hip. So it matches up pretty well. She did survive. She was in the hospital, but she did survive. And that's her claim to fame, getting hit by a meteorite. So if we don't have enough to worry about now with pandemics and tornadoes, and a tornado in my neighborhood last week, we can also worry about this if we want to. And that's Dr. Elman. He was my uh, one of my advisors for graduate school, and he passed away about a year and a half ago. So, but he was the one who gave us a private tour. And he actually sent me some meteorites to use for teaching at, uh, at TCC. So anyway, uh, very, very good teacher. I learned a lot from him. So hopefully everybody enjoyed class today. I think I just went about, no, it's right 1130. I ended right on time. Does anybody have any questions? Now, just a comment that, that this was, again, so very, very informative. Thank you so much. It brings so much of my life where I did travel to the Grand Canyon and other places so like Hawaii. Brings it all together for me in a totally different way. Thank you so much, Maureen. Well, thanks, Penny. Thanks for the feedback. Um, anybody else have any questions? If, if not, we'll see. Next week, we're going to cover glacier um, parks. Go ahead. I have a question about when you were talking about the Grand Canyon, the erosion sediments, the deposits that came out of it, where are they at? What part of the U.S. or Mexico did they wind up in? Well, wherever the Colorado River goes, which I think it goes into California, doesn't it? And it goes into the Pacific Ocean. So that's probably where they are, right? 
it seems like a lot of stuff where there might be a, I mean, you know, like the Mississippi has all the delta down below all the sediments and deposits. You would think that would be a rather large formation of some note where all that well, stuff deposits. It's a different type of um, plate balance. You know, California's got that narrow, it's got a trench there. It doesn't, it's not as flat as like the Mississippi. So I think it probably is deeper right offshore there. So I think it goes farther. Um, but that's a good question. That's good, good thinking. Um, anybody else? Okay. So you have a quick comment. I worked for um, I worked for the National Park Service for over 20 years. Wow. This gives me a whole different perspective. I worked with the archaeologists, so some of these terms I've seen in passing, but I never really had a deep understanding of how it all fit together. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Good. I'm so glad. I'm glad to get the feedback. Uh, thanks for saying that. And uh, look forward to glaciers next week and some glacier parks. You, you're doing an excellent job. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good week. Let's hope we don't have any more tornadoes. <laughs> I'm going to end the meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.